Hello students, this is Professor Dominic coming to you from my new office in uh, the DSS building in room 243. I just moved here. If you need to see me outside of class, this is where you should come. Uh, if you need to call me, of course, please do. I'm not going to put my phone number on YouTube, so please refer to the emails that I sent you. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about what exactly we're going to be doing in this class and this will also help you um, get a feeling for what I'm going to ask you to do in the first assignment and also what you are going to be doing in terms of vocabulary words. There will be some things that I introduce to you here and then there will also be uh, a vocabulary list up on D2L. Don't look for it before um, Friday night because I haven't written it yet. Um, so today uh, I'm recording this. It is Thursday, August 30th, 2018. And I'm going to go ahead and start talking a little bit about what we're doing in this class, talk about some of the things that are in our textbooks, and just give you kind of an overview to what um, art and design happens to be. So um, we have a history of design, really, and uh, in the past we might have had two uh, course, separate courses, a course of the history of graphic design and a course for the history of art. So what is art history and what is graphic design history and why do they matter? Why do we need to know this? Uh, really, I always say to people, um, the history of art is the history of us. It's the history of human beings. And as we get deeper into the course with the very first chapter, you'll see that human beings have needed to make marks on things for as long as there have been human beings. Uh, and some of those marks are artistic. Some of them are not, but we're only interested in the ones that are. With design, we have people who are communicating things for a very particular purpose often. There's all different kinds of design, so we're gonna break it down and look at it a little bit in this slideshow. So our graphic design history textbook tells us graphic design is never just there. I love my typo, I catch it now. Uh, it is never just there, that should be is not. In. And what that means when we talk about graphic design, we're talking about things like the design of, well, your, your very textbook, for example. This was designed by someone. Someone thought about the layout of this. Um, nowadays, people often think of it in terms of um, digital design, of web pages, of things like that, um, game design really anything that appears in print or on the web is something that has been designed whether people did it well or they did it or not and it is meant as it says right there it is never just there so graphic artifacts always serve a purpose and contain an agenda no matter how neutral or natural they appear to be so something as neutral as an iphone um, Otterbox, this is not Otterbox. Um, look, and I just dropped it, almost dropped it, showing you exactly well. Th that's the agenda to protect my iPhone. Someone had to design this. So, no matter how neutral or natural it might be, it serves a purpose. It contains an agenda. And on the back, so it's not Otterbox, it says Life Proof. So, the brand name is there. That is also uh, important. Everything is there for a reason. Someone is addressing someone else for some reason through every object of designed communication. The graphic forms of design are expressions of the forces that shape our lives. It is very influential. Sometimes I think of graphic designers as um, they can be geniuses, evil geniuses, you know, who are trying to um, sell cigarettes, or they are good geniuses who are trying to promote good ideas. So um, the graphic forms of design are the expressions of the forces that shape our lives. 
and we also need a critical history of graphic design uh, to provide ways of thinking about graphic form, form to gain insight into design as a cultural practice. The way that books are designed and put together didn't just happen. It's a practice that goes back to when people were still writing on cave walls, when people were still painting on tomb walls in ancient Egypt. All of these things led up to um, the forms that we use to read books and to read articles and you know all the contemporary things that we do today. So all of this is very important to the history of graphic design. And then the next question is just as important to the history of graphic design as it is to art history. So that what then should we look at? and just as important how. And as we look uh, in art history, um, one of the things that the two disciplines have in common is there's definitely tastemakers out there, tastemakers who are determining, well, what is it that's important to look at? What is it that is important to buy? What is a trend? What is popular in the art world? Why is it popular? Who determined that it was popular? How did it get to be that way? So uh, all of these things come into play in both graphic design and art history. So before I go any farther with these questions, I'm going to recap some information from the Elements of Art course. And if you didn't take Elements of Art, don't panic, uh, because I'm going to give it to you in the next two slides real briefly, because uh, it could take up a whole lot of time. But these are words that I'm going to be using through the semester, and some of them may seem quite, well, elementary to you but they're words that you're going to need to know in order to talk about art and in order to talk about design. So saying the elements of art is the same as saying the language of art and the principles of design come into play in the ways that artists use the elements. So here's a quick refresher into what these things are. So the elements of art are line, you know, like you see right there, that's a squiggly line. Lines can be sh uh, straight, they can be squiggly, they can be dashed, dotted, hatched, all manner of things. Color is important, um, of course, because paintings contain color. A lot of even drawings occasionally contain color. When I talk about value, as you can see on the screen, there is a value scale right there from the very lightest shade to, or lightest tint, to the very uh, darkest shade. And so when we talk about value, tonal value, that's what we're talking about. Is there a lot of contrast from light to dark within a work? Um, shape, um, we know our shapes, of course, from kindergarten, I would hope. And also form, so shape, uh, is a scent usually two-dimensional when we're talking about it, although it could be three-dimensional. But then when we go into three dimensions, it becomes form. So a triangle becomes a pyramid, a rectangle becomes a prism, a square becomes a cube, a circle becomes a sphere. And then form can have mass, and mass refers to the weight of the form. That might be a principle of design, so we'll get to that in a second. And then texture. So um, a work of art can um, look as though it is absolutely realistic. So for example, you could be looking at a painting of um, someone wearing fur and it could look so real that you feel as though you could reach out and touch that fur. That's visual texture because it, well, it's on a flat surface. And if it's an artist who's painting very realistically, chances are they've, it's just completely flat. It's not a rough texture for real. Um, uh, same thing with like trees. If an artist has realistically painted a tree bark, the texture appears rough. 
Also, in um, works of art, sometimes artists use the actual texture of a thing. The actual tree bark in a sculpture would make that sculpture actually feel rough if you top touched it. So you get the idea. Um, space is also very important in terms of uh, how an artist takes the picture frame. You know, and by picture frame, think of the rectangle or circle or square in which a work of art appears as the frame of that work of art and then how the artist uses that space is very important um, sometimes things that might appear flat like this little house with trees and sun in the sky artists might overlap shapes in space they might use linear perspective to create the illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional form and we also have positive space and negative space so positive space uh, it all depends. So when you look at these two butterflies, um, positive space could be the shape of the butterfly itself, and then negative space would be the space around the butterfly. Although artists play that with that relationship all the time, as we will see going through time, uh, especially in graphic design, because, well, it makes things look interesting when you are creating um, something that you want people to notice. So the principles of design then are the ways in which artists take the elements and put them together. So movement is the path that your eye takes through a work of art, um, often to a focal point, which would be um, the use of emphasis. So a focal point here might be, you know, the flat middle flower because it is bigger and a different color from all of the other flowers. So the artist is directing your eye, he's causing movement to the focal point, the center of the piece here, which is the emphasis, the part of the design that catches the viewer's attention. Uh, so, and there's a lot of different ways that artists do that, but you can see that from the slide. And then uh, proportion is the feeling of unity that can be created when all parts, sizes, amounts, or number um, relate well with each other within the space. And so when we're drawing the human figure, proportion often refers to the size of the head compared to the rest of the body. And a lot of people through time have worked out um, a canon of proportions so that artists are drawing the human figure realistically and the way that it actually appears in nature. Now, some people take proportion and they distort it on purpose for a variety of reasons. So uh, we will also see that used in both art history and graphic design. Repetition works with pattern. So pattern, these are not exactly in great order. So here we have pattern. So pattern is the repeating of an object or symbol all over a work of art. If you think of an artist like Andy Warhol, who did um, those famous um, pieces of Marilyn Monroe where her face is repeated over and over and over again. It creates both a pattern and a repetition. So repetition works with pattern to make the work of art seem active. The repetition of elements of design creates unity within the work of art, which is this here, the feeling of harmony between all parts of the work of art, which creates a sense of completion. And then variety is the use of several elements of design to hold the viewer's attention and to guide the viewer's eye through and around the work of art. Emphasis is the part of the design. I've mentioned that already. I don't think I need to do that again. Rhythm. Rhythm is created when one or more elements of design are used repeatedly to create a feeling of organized movement. Rhythm creates a mood like music or dancing to keep uh, rhythm exciting and active. Variety is essential. So you might make, break things up a little bit. Like here you have squiggly lines. So they're repeated. You get a rhythm through the repeat, but some of them um, are repeated in one direction and some are repeated in another direction. And then finally, we have balance. Balance is the distribution of the visual weight of 
objects, colors, texture, and space. If the design was a scale, these elements should be balanced to make a design feel stable. In symmetrical balance, the elements used on one side of a design are similar to those used on the other. It's asymmetrical balance. Oh, I mean that's symmetrical balance. In asymmetrical balance, the sides are different, but they can still look balanced. In radial balance, the elements are arranged around a central point, um, and that may be similar as well. So moving on, we're going to look a little bit now um, on a little bit about art history itself. So in this particular course, we will be studying the major periods and styles of what is known as Western art with forays into multicultural studies. So what does that mean, Western art? The Western world comprises North America and Europe, um, often uh, involves ancient Egypt, even though that is... African, uh, and also the ancient Near East, and the non-Western world comprises all the areas and traditions outside those boundaries. And these categories are based as much about uh, on ideas about culture as geography, because, you know, if you're standing in one part of the world, what is the West might be very different, and what is the East might be very different. Uh, another thing that we will see in both graphic design history and um, art history is talking about aesthetics. So what is aesthetics? Aesthetics is a branch of philosophy that deals with notions such as the ugly, the beautiful, the sublime, the comic, as applicable to the fine arts with a view to establishing the meaning and validity of critical judgments concerning works of art and the principles underlying or justifying such judgments. That's number one, that's a mouthful, right? And then number two is the study of mind and emotions in relationship to the sense of beauty. So when we talk about, you might have heard people say, that's aesthetically pleasing. So what they mean is the artist or designer or whomever has arranged things in such a way that it is pleasing to the eye, generally. And so aesthetics is all about making those judgments. And it's extremely subjective. Art is extremely subjective. It's very deeply personal about what you think is beautiful or what someone else might think is beautiful. And in the West... The major visual arts, and again, we're going to be talking about the visual arts in this course, um, fall into three broad categories. Um, so we have pictures, which um, the word picture comes from the Latin pingo, which means I paint, and those are pictures that have two-dimensional images from the Latin imago, meaning likeness, uh, and the light just went out with height and width. Going to make the light go back up. Going to stand up. Do something, all right. Maybe it's whatever. All right, so it's almost like being in class with me, isn't it? Okay, so paintings uh, are pictures, but that also pictures also include mosaics, stained glass, tapestries, drawings, prints, and photographs. And then sculptures comes from the Latin word sculpere, meaning to carve. So unlike pictures, sculptures are three-dimensional. Besides height and width, they have depth. And sculptures have uh, been traditionally made of a variety of materials, such as stone, metal, wood, clay. And more modern artists incorporate e everything and anything. So you see glass, plastics, cloth, string, wire, television monitors, animal carcasses, trash, styrofoam, chocolate, lipstick. Seriously, it's crazy. And then architecture, finally. So architecture uh, means high, archy, and buildings, texture. And that's the most utilitarian because we live, work, and sleep and play and do things in buildings. And buildings are generally meant to, um, they're designed to enclose and order space for specific purposes. Um, they often contain pictures and sculptures, uh, as well as other forms of visual art. They also contain things that have been designed, things like furniture, things like um, dishes, you know, everything that you can imagine. Um, so buildings contain art. So 
Now we're going to think about a little bit, why do artists make art? Why do we do this? What, well, like I said, I think it's the oldest human impulse going, you know, to make art, to make marks on things. So, and that kind of goes right into here. Here we have this um, image of King Tut's mask, you know, and one powerful motive for making art is the wish to leave behind after death something of value by which to be remembered. King Tut lived over 3,000 years ago, but we know who he is. So works of art can prolong either the artist's existence or the person that they're commemorating. We don't know who made uh, the artwork in King Tut's tomb. Um, so in this particular case, it's meant to um, be a representation of Tut. It is a portrait, and artists are often commissioned to paint portraits or representations of specific people. Uh, and it's not only the features of an individual that are valued as an extension of self after death. So a patron uh, is someone who commissions or sponsors a work of art, uh, and they often order more monumental tributes. So in ancient China, um, the Emperor Qin, it's spelled Q-I-N, but it's pronounced Qin, was buried with a bodyguard of several thousand life-size terracotta statues of warriors. <gasps> Hang on a second. Thing. There goes my light. All right, I'm back. I'm coming back, and here I am with my little guy. So this is actually a friend of mine picked this up for me in China. And this is a little terracotta statue um, reproduction of one of these warriors. These were life size, several thousand of them in this guy's tomb. Each one is individual. They're all a little bit different. Each one has something different like on their, um, their clothes, their faces, their hair, their hats. Each one is individual if you can imagine. So they were meant to guard this guy's body in the uh, afterlife rather than like killing all of your servants and burying them with you alive. He did this. And then the Taj Mahal, this beautiful building, uh, is real. The, it is um, a tomb, a mausoleum for an Indian uh, emperor, Shah Jahan, as a memorial to his favorite wife. He loved her so much and went into so much mourning um, after she died that he built this incredible building that stands to this day. It was built in the 17th century, but it stands to this day. So now we're going to look briefly at the values of art because I'm looking at my watch. <laughs> All right, so material, what that means is a work of art might be valued because it's made of a precious metal or material like King Tut's mask. Um, intrinsic, a work of art might contain valuable material, but that's not the primary basis on which that that work of art is ju uh, judged. Its intrinsic value depends largely on the assessment of the artist who created it, and its own aesthetic character. And we're going to look at examples of each of these as well. And then religious, one of the traditional ways in which art has been valued is in terms of its religious significance. Paintings and sculptures depicting gods and goddesses make their images accessible. Nationalistic, uh, works of art have nationalistic value in as much as they express, express the pride and accomplishment of a particular culture. And then psychological, one of the psychological aspects of art is its ability to attract and repel us. And this is not necessarily a function of whether or not we find a particular work of art aesthetically pleasing. It's meant um, not all art is beautiful, you know, and that's that goes ties into um, aesthetics. Sometimes it shocks us and that can be a, a different kind of aesthetic experience. Um, it's more of a psychological experience. So material value, going back to King Tut's tomb again, this is uh, actually a detail of uh, a chair that was in his tomb that was covered with gold leaf where you take sheets, very, very thin sheets of gold, and you press them into um, the material, in this case wood, and then they also used a lot of semi-precious stones, and sometimes they would grind up semi-precious stones and make a paste, which is what you see um, in kind of the, the hair that you see here and in the other colors of the other objects. So this has material value. It also has intrinsic value because 
uh, in our culture, we value ancient things. And so this is very ancient, it's very fragile, and we consider it to be of great value. So material value and then intrinsic value, Mona Lisa, uh, it's painted on wood in oil paint. So uh, materially, those things are not as costly as the gold that we see in King Tut's tomb. However, it's the Mona Lisa painted by Leonardo da Vinci, probably one of the most famous paintings in Western culture, and also um, painted by one of the most famous artists in Western culture. Intrinsic value religious value. So here is an example. This is again da Vinci on the Madonna of the Rocks. This is um, showing the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus and Saint, um, baby Saint uh, John the Baptist meeting for the first time. And this would have been in a church probably um, as an altarpiece and it was meant to inspire, um, you know, real religious wonder and um, it's meant to be beautiful um, to cause you know a religious experience in the person viewing it and the nationalistic value this is a photograph that was taken at the site uh, of where the uh, twin towers were before they were um, destroyed during uh, September 11th uh, 2001 and you know this was a photograph that was put up as you know commemoration of what had happened and a memoriam to the people um, who died so it's meant to <coughs> excuse me in this case um, make people feel proud of their country and then psychological value is when <coughs> I've been really sick, sorry. Um, when an artist does something to a work of art, here we have um, L-O-O-H-Q, and I think I need to pause for a moment. Okay, I'm better. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna go back, okay. So let me go back for a moment to, okay, psychological value. So the Mona Lisa is the most copied uh, work of art in the world. Uh, this was painted by Marcel Duchamp, who was part of a group of artists known as the Dada artists. And the Dadas wanted to make fun of art as it was and make fun of everything. And so he took the Mona Lisa and drew a little mustache and goatee on her. And Below it is are the letters L-H-O-O-Q, which if you say it with a French accent, it's supposed to sound as though you're saying in French, she has a nice ass. Um, yeah. So again, he is trying to kind of turn things on their head, and some people were offended by that. And so this was done like in the early 20th century. So psychological value. You're not, you don't like it, it offends you, or, um, you know, there are other types of psychological value, too, um, that might knock you out and you think are beautiful, but in any case, um, this is what many textbooks use as an example of psychological value. So art and illusion, so some other terms that we'll be using throughout the semester. So naturalism is a style of art that seeks to represent objects as they actually appear in nature. And then figurative means representing the likeness of a recognizable human or animal figure. Uh, it may be abstracted, but you can still recognize it as a human or an animal. And then representational means you're representing natural objects in recognizable form. Uh, Non-representational art and non-objective art is art that is completely abstract and doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's meant to just be there for its form and color. That's a whole other thing, which we'll get into towards the end of the semester. And then trompe l'oeil painting is a type of painting that deceives the eye with its appearance of reality. Trompe l'oeil is a French term that means fool the eye. So this is an example of a 17th century trompe l'oeil painting where it's meant to, you're meant to look at it and feel as though you could actually pluck one of those uh, pieces of paper off of the painting and it would be real. It fools the eye. And then, I don't remember why I threw this in here. 
here, so we'll just move along. Oh, landscape painting. So yeah, so then there's also, um, we'll just stick here with, with this nice picture of God as architect uh, for a moment, um, because one of the things that they do um, in philosophy, Plato and Aristotle um, often argued about the idea of the artist um, trying to be like God because the artist is trying to create. So that's where that comes from. Um, but what I'm going to show you next in painting in particular in art, there's a couple of different kinds of um, genres, shall we say, that artists tend to stick to. So one of those is landscape painting. So the, these are your paintings of, um, you know, beautiful rolling hills, trees, meadows, flowers, mountains, and then there's sort of an adjunct to this, which is cityscapes, you know, where people are showing a city block or, you know, a city skyline. That kind of fall, that falls into landscape painting, but because it's in a city, it's not, you know, trees and grass and so forth, it's called cityscape. Still life painting is usually representations of objects that are still. So this is Paul Cezanne um, with a bowl of fruit. Um, bowls of fruit are real popular in still life painting, but really anything can pop up in a still life painting that is, is a thing that does not move. So you see like a lot of vases of flowers, you see, um, oh, I don't know, um, collections of objects like Going back to that trompe this could also be considered a still life, actually, because none of these objects actually move, so it's a still life. And then, um, you know, we have architecture. I don't know where that, why I threw that in there, but there it is. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to let you guys read this on your own. Um, I think I put in a little bit more than I intended to going back in the architecture. So art collecting, this is also is a thing that comes into um, the arts. And I'm also going to let you guys read this on your own. Um, what I'm going to do is post this up on D2L and you'll have this little movie and then you'll also have the slideshow and then there will also be a vocab list. So these three things together are something that will help you with the first quiz. But as I said, do not look for this before Friday night. Um, give your tired professor some time to create some things and I'm going to let, um, let it go on that note. And I look forward to seeing you all online. As always, email or call me if you have any questions or problems.